all right, here's your chance. You do it every week now to say I told you so. You have again predicted the future. It's almost like you're, you're precognizant or recognizant or whatever the case may be. And you called it again. We're going to get into it in a second but because they started off the program with it. But again, I, I think you've got Jericho's house bugged. Either that or you're eavesdropping on his... Have you got a wire on his phone to Tony Khan? I know he's got a bat phone. That's what Tony Khan's red phone on his desk is. Hotline to Jericho. This week, they were at the Joe and Harry Freeman Coliseum in beautiful downtown San Antonio, Texas. And boy, that building looks a lot better on TV than it does when you're sitting in it. But uh, we started out with a recap of MJF and Ricky Starks last week and the, the match and the incident, the ball kicking. And here comes Starks. And did you see this crowd going crazy for him? They loved him. He came out, he dressed like he was somebody. I'm not saying I'd look good in that outfit, but it looked good on him. But he, he looked like a star. He looked like a professional something or other. The crowd was loving him. And he did a great promo. He owned his loss last week without making excuses, even though he was cheated and made sure to make mention of that too. But he looked forward to and looked ahead to getting another chance because he's not going to roll over and play dead. There's going to be a next time. He vowed it with MJF for the title. He had emotion. He had delivery. He's a feisty baby face. It's not going to back down. And his quote was, if I got to work my way back to the top to a title shot, then line him up. And then here comes Judas. And I'm not talking about the music. I, I was like, <laughs> God damn it. Boom, 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 boom. And here they come, the Jericho appreciators. Jericho, Sammy Garcia, Sammy Garcia, Sammy Guevara. And I, at first I wrote, what's his name? Because wearing sunglasses, I thought it was the 2.0 number two, but it was Daniel Garcia. But they come down and stay in the aisleway so they don't crowd Starks in the ring, but Jericho's doing the talking. And of course, he puts Starks over. You're a million-dollar talent. You'll be champion someday, but you're not quite ready. You need some teaching, some advice. You need Chris Jericho. So basically the same pitch he gives to Tony Khan about everything. The fans, while Jericho is talking, start organically chanting, Sammy sucks, Sammy sucks. And Jericho said, hey, if you're saying Sammy sucks, that's like you're saying I suck, and I don't suck. So it brings it back to him because they're chanting for the fucking heel they don't like next to him. Or chanting against the heel. Anyway... Obviously, he offered Starks the opportunity to join the Jericho appreciators, and Starks fired back up at him, and it was great. He said Jericho used to come out built like an air fryer, but now he's dropped weight. He looks good. <laughs> he's dressed like a single dad on his fifth divorce. I've, again, I'm thinking they may be making a mistake trying to send MJF to Danielson all, all of a sudden, MJF and Starks have some more promos in them. But anyway, Starks turned down the offer to join the boy band. As he said, he called Jericho a clout vampire. <laughs> and the J and JAS stands for jobbers, and he called the Stooges jazz holes. You're not going to suck the life out of me, but if you want something to suck, this was... <sighs> Again, whoa, whoa, hold on. He said, if you want something to suck, and then he went like he was going to take off his pants. Yeah, yeah. And I've I, <laughs> Jericho was blown out verbally in this, in this thing because you knew what Jericho's, it's the same thing he's been doing for three years. Oh, you should join the group. And he gets turned down, he gets mad, whatever. It was a long promo, but Starks was on fire, and it's better than normal AEW television. So I was with it up till this point. And then here we go. All of a sudden, from behind, 
to jump Starks in the ring was Jake Hager and that stupid purple hat. And once he hits him, then the others come in and jump him. And at that point, I had the thought, Brian, again, has anybody ever worked for a promotion longer and done less while they were there than Jake Hager in AEW? Dr. Luther in AEW. Well, you got me there. All righty then. So they beat the shit out of Starks, and Jericho's got the bat, and the three heels are holding Starks, and Jericho's about to hit him with the bat. And music. Here comes action and ready. Now we see what's going to happen because Jericho cannot in any way be made to look bad by the fact that this poor kid ain't ready for this. So they're going to give the impression. Now remember, Ricky Starks, who just challenged for the world title last week, was basically just jumped with no fucking... He didn't get any fight because the guy hit him from behind. The others were on him. He just got tackled and pancaked. But here comes Action Andretti. Ducks Jericho's bat, springs off, hits him with a flying elbow while the other three heels are standing there watching. Then Hager runs at him. <laughs> and Action Andretti ducks him and Hager goes over the top rope. Then Sammy Rennie clotheslines Sammy. And now Starks gets the shit can Garcia out of the ring. So now they are using Starks to get not only Jericho, but Action Andretti over as well. He's gone in one week from world title contender to best friend of Action Andretti. And then Jericho was laying motionless in the ring so that I think he called an audible. And Andretti ran up and hit a fucking springboard moonsault on Jericho while Starks was selling his ribs. So, again, Action Andretti saved Ricky Starks' ass by routing all by himself a former WWE champion, an MMA fighter, and two pushed heels armed with a baseball bat. And Starks instead of going from a world title match that he was cheated out of and lost into a program with somebody of some repute to win in the end and get back over is going to go from loss to loss so that Action Andretti can get some spotlight. Did I summarize that kind of the way you were thinking about it, Brian, or did you see a nuance that I missed? Well, again, I wasn't surprised by Jericho latching on to Ricky Starks, but I agree with what you're saying about the timing being a big issue here. It's a tough thing. If they're determined to go MJF Brian Danielson, and it seems that they are, obviously I could see why they did that, but then why do everything with MJF and Starks for a two-week thing? If it's going to lead to this, and like you said, not even to judge action Andretti X, we've barely seen him. He does need a big brother or a best friend, someone to help him. I don't know if Ricky Starks was that guy right now. I think he's, he's become the big brother. Starks is now the best friend. That's not the role he should be playing right now. The I fans are reacting that. to him. Again, the saddest thing about AEW is, for all the people that killed WWE for not pushing wrestlers that the fans organically reacted to, whether it's FTR, whether it's Ricky Starks, there's been various examples where they don't get the push that the fans seem to want them to have. We'll see what happens with Starks. War Wardlow got pushed out the door. Starks is having an interesting several weeks now where the fans are really reacting to him. He's clearly letting loose on his promos and he's getting good reactions to everything. How will they mess this up? Usually the answer is as simple as Jericho, but we'll see because there's a lot of moving parts here. Well, up next was number 247 of the Best of Seven series between the Buckaroos and Twinkle Toes and the Bermuda Triangle. This was the special Hammers Legal No Disqualification Lazy Booking stipulation. Um, I mean, what can I say? In the cutlet, was it ringside in a green elf costume? They don't make any effort to even try to tell people they're in any way serious about this shit. And again, same thing at the bell. 
Sloppy, fake-looking six-way fight, choreographed six-way synchronized spot, and a triple dive. So that's enough of that. Um, how ridiculous is it? And it, the only reason for it is the self-indulgency of the EVPs and their inflated sense of their own self-importance that you put two teams that only know how to have one kind of match against each other seven weeks in a fucking row. Save the plane fare. Show the same tape seven times. Nobody'd notice. So, again, on visual speed search, they had furniture, they had garbage cans, they had the comedy stooges and the funny outfits, a Christmas tree in the ring, a couple of circus stunts off the ropes through the tables, a barbed wire baseball bat. And, I mean, this may have been the most offensive one yet just because of all that. And then after 15 minutes of that and afterbirth where the heel baby faces beat up the baby face heels and got juice on them. Ah, did I miss anything? No, it was an all right match. I got really high before it started, so I enjoyed it a little bit. I agree about Cutler. That was just ridiculous. And even if you were really high and trying to lose yourself in this match, that took it down a notch or two. But it was all right for what it was. It was, you know, you know who it was and you know what they do. Yeah. So I figured, let me get high and try to enjoy it. Well, you got high and I was feeling mighty low when it was over with. But MJF popped up after that. An interview taped last week after the match and the deal. He was hot at Danielson for interfering. He was looking for him, yelling at him. It was great, obviously. And that's why I noted, I hope that the previous Buckaroos exhibition didn't run everybody off before they saw it so they could see this. But then, my oh God, if they had only given this effort to, I don't know, anybody in the past three years, how many times have we seen, my God, they've debuted Jay Lethal, or they debuted this guy, or they debuted that guy. You never hear them talk. They never win. They never do anything. They just show up and do a job. And, Tony was in the back with Action Andretti, the new biggest star in wrestling. He's two inches shorter than Tony, and Tony's got to be two inches shorter than me. So I don't know what the fuck. But the promo, <sighs> Action tried hard on this promo. He did. And, and he's got potential because, obviously, I can't imagine he's ever done any TV promos before since he'd never been on fucking television. But he memorized his material, and he tried to say it with some conviction. But he's just green at this. He's not comfortable. Plus, he had to memorize the shit. Nobody speaks like this. It needed more emotion. He rushed it, and it was... He was speaking material that when he wrote it down to memorize it, it sounds great, but he he's not a person that speaks like that. And, but he's going to be a better promo before he gets six inches taller. I can guarantee you that. But he got longer to speak here than anybody ever. And remember the running joke was as soon as the guy gets the question pitched to him, he says, well, and then somebody fucking hits him with a ball bat. This was two minutes and he laid it down, right? And then here comes 2.0 in. And he stands them off in this stagey way where he's got his fists clenched. And they tell him he's on a hot streak. Some might even say, you're on fire. And then Andretti looks puzzled at that remark and then immediately spins 180 degrees around to look behind him, conveniently, where Jericho hits him in the face with a fireball. And then within... I don't know what, less than 10 seconds. He's laying on the floor. His face has been set on fire and they cut away. Good God. I, I'm, you know, same with the Hindenburg. Soon as half of it crashed, they said, well, fuck, we've seen the best part. We'll be right back. So uh, They're going to do Action Andretti just to piss us off, right? Just to say, well, they say we never push anyone properly or give him any time to talk so they're going to do everything we've been saying with action and ready he rubbed his face into a ground they're copying steamboat and flair no oh yeah there's anything after, wrong with that that's right after he, well after he burned him with the fireball that he rubbed his face on a concrete like the flair steamboat thing how many times are they going to sandpaper this kid's face 
is he going to have scars and things when he shows up next week to save the day again? Or are they going to remember that? I was hoping we were past Jericho throwing fire, but... He's a wizard. At least he didn't call himself a wizard. But he is a wizard. No, he's not. He's, he's figured out a way to cast a spell over Tony Khan. Anyway, so then in the ring was Renee Moxley Good, and she brought out Brian Danielson. And the question proposed to Mr. Danielson was after all the things that have happened with William Regal, where does this leave the BBC? And Danielson said he doesn't expect the rest of the guys in the BBC to forgive Regal. But then he, he switched and he started putting San Antonio over. It's almost like the Renee asked him a question. He skipped his happy talk. He had to go back and get it. But he trained there for real at his first match there. He went to Shawn Michaels wrestling school. Well, Rudy Gonzalez's wrestling school. Shawn Michaels was financing. And he got big pops with that. And when he plugged Shawn Michaels, the people started chanting HBK. Yeah, that's what you want on your show. Yeah, well, of course. Um, maybe they'll get him one of these days. Then he said that Regal made him the wrestler and the person he is today. And if you notice now, Regal had molten lava level heat when he first came out with MJF after the turn. Then with what they did, it, it kind of, or not when he first came out after the turn, but not with MJF that first week when Moxley told him to just leave and don't come back. And he came back for two more curtain calls, but he went from having molten heat to kind of having the heat taken off of him to now he didn't really get booed, but you can tell, and this may have been the idea, the fans there don't like him as much as they used to because they know he left them. So even Danielson putting him over like Mother Teresa and saying he loved having him in AEW, the people were not like, oh, we want Regal, which is good. You don't want him chanting something for somebody that's not going to come back. Well, with everyone knowing everything, he should probably shouldn't even be talking about him anymore at this point. He, well, re he this referenced is, him by name nonstop in this promo. That's what I, that's. <sighs> they had him come out and do the one farewell where Moxley got to tell him off. Then they had him come out and do the second farewell where MJF got to attack him from behind. Then they had him come back out and do the pre-tape that was put in a time capsule with Shivani in case anything happened to him. And now they're doing a goddamn of uh, what's the word I'm searching for a, a, um, um, the speech they give at the funerals, a eulogy for what he meant to, uh, it, it, he's gotten more TV time to leave than anybody else gets to debut. So finally, then Danielson does same thing. He starts firing up and, and, you know, really getting serious with it and says, MJF is going to learn there's consequences to his actions. And he told MJF, come out here right now. And it was really a good promo. It had been even better if Regal hadn't bailed and went back to the WWE and was going to come back and do something. But it, Danielson's a great talker in his own fashion. He sounds like himself. He's very natural. But the music that plays is not MJF's. It's the other page with Stokely. And... I wish I'd like to see Stokely with a top guy that I gave a shit about because he can talk and he's kind of different. The other page starts talking and promo and Danielson Danielson fired back and, but Stokely's thing, he just called, called fucking Danielson, you raggedy bitch. That just <laughs> cracked me up. You raggedy bitch. But this went back and forth too long with page before Danielson said, how about right here, right now? Where have we heard that before lately? And the fans wanted it, but the other page got a little heat by weaseling out of it because he wasn't dressed. Said, how about next week? Okay, and they left. So <sighs> we're, <sighs> we're seeing a lot of similar shit going on with these programs, and it, it kind of all blurs together, but it hasn't stunk so far except for the EVPs. We're getting there. Moxley was in a garage somewhere wondering when him and Adam Page, old hangnail, are going to settle shit. Have we figured out, is Moxley going to turn 
who between Hangnail Page and John Moxley, whose side are we supposed to be on? Or does anybody care about either one of them and they just they've just been put together? I don't know. Well, anyway, Samoa Joe in a suit with the belt sitting in front of the Christmas tree. This is Samoa Joe. He's articulate. He's well-spoken. He's educated. He was punched as pleased with himself. He wasn't out there doing the screaming, drooling, mad, vicious island Samoan. He's the goddamn intelligent, badass, dressed up, looks like somebody fucking Samoan that can verbally take you apart and then lose his shit and do it physically. And I like this Joe. And he's got great delivery. And he's talking about Wardlow on I get December 28th next week's show. But this is how you feature Samoa Joe. And at least they're doing something. He's winning some of these matches. He's winning all of his matches now. And he's getting some promos. And he's different than the the Samoan, the street Samoans like the bloodline or the fish eating Samoans like Afa and Sika from generations ago. That's why the the funniest thing he ever said to me, and he wasn't even trying to be funny, was when Russo had the dagum. Remember this in TNA, he not only had Joe put a tribal tattoo, a fake one on his face, but he had one of the pay per views of Samoan fire dancers and drummers and and all this stuff and barefoot and the whole thing coming out and doing a dance for joe's entrance and joe's like i'm i'm from california i got a college education what does he think i'm a goddamn you know tree climber from the island but it was shit stained for you he you know nevertheless good promo what'd you think yeah Well, that's, uh, that says it all. So we're moving along, aren't we? I just don't think it helps. I don't know. Helps what? Go ahead. Say it. Everything with the TV title since Wardlow got it has been a disaster. And I don't, oh, think, yeah. I don't think Joe means as much as he should. You said that this is Joe, this promo right here. Have we seen this before? This is the first time we're really getting this on the show. On this program, yeah. And yes. Joe means less than he has at any point since he came in. So I don't know. We'll see what they do, but I wasn't too excited about this. Well, but if, now here's the problem. Who's he going to work you, with? Other than Wardlow, who's he working with? Well, I don't know. You can have great matches, and you can do great interviews, but if the title belt that you hold means nothing because there's three TV titles or four TV titles, and the booking is the shits, I didn't say it was you know good, but at least we're getting to hear him talk. All right, Hook. Hook is back. And Hook had a single match with a guy named Exodus Prime. I thought he was one of the Transformers. No, that's a different... That's a different... It did sound like a Transformer, though. Exodus Prime. Well, it, it, is his last name Prime and his first name, his mother and father saw him and said, well, we got to name him after Grandpa Exodus or... Does that mean something or what? Um, He's wrestling any, a man whose first name is Hook. Well, you I guess you, uh, you got a point there. So again, starts great, ends in the shitter. I like Hook. He's got a different style. He used the amateur wrestling judo style mix. He dominated this guy. He looked great. He doesn't fuck shit up. His throws are different. The people like him. He's got the charisma, whatever. That's great. Nice little three or four minute win, whatever it was. Immediately, from the parking lot, on the screen, there's Stokely and Big Bill and Lee Moriarty, fake kicking Jungle Boy, and Big Bill picks him up and choke slams him into a dumpster. So, and after the hook sees that and just walks up the ramp with his head down, and Moxley music starts playing because he's coming from the other side of the arena. Hook gets a win, looks good in the ring. People cheer him. And everything's fine. And then they go immediately to one of the faker looking things that they're going to do in this show. And it's stupid. And it's another backstage. How many backstage attacks have we seen 
this week, just on two programs we've just been talking about. And and he just, and then Hook just walks up the ramp with his head down, like, well, yeah, my new partner just got the shit kicked out of him. So every time they do something right, they can't get out of it then. They've got to carry it on and do something to make you forget that you were actually interested in what they just did. I mean, was that, it, it was like night and day. They played that Moxley music so fast. Were they just desperate to get it on for the nine o'clock hour? Yes. That's what they wanted to say. They wanted somebody that the people halfway fucking recognize, you know, in the ring at that point. But yeah, boom. And again, now it's Moxley with Claudio because they're in the BBC together against Darius Martin with his brother Dante. Who the fuck are we supposed to cheer for? And why the and Moxley earlier had been saying, well, yeah, I hear this kid, you know, he he hurt his knee and then he gets a car wreck. Maybe he's injury prone. Is it going to be my fault if I hurt him? Why does Moxley want to hurt the nice young kid that's trying to make his way in wrestling that has doesn't do anything to offend anyone or stab anybody in the back? Why does Moxley, the baby face, want to? take this nice kid out past the rail into the arena and suplex him on the concrete floor without any provocation. The idea of having a baby face that hurts people and beats people up and drinks their bones and eats their blood is that you will get to see a guy like that that doesn't give a shit kick the shit out of the heels that have been screwing everybody around. Not hospitalize and paralyze and sanitize and homogenize and hurt and end the career of a young, nice-looking, baby-faced kid that likes to do flying moves and impress the young fans. That's what doesn't make sense. It's a match, not a blood feud. So why does, just because Moxley's being Moxley, what motivation mentally does he have to take this kid out in the arena and start suplexing him around on the concrete? It's Mark bullshit for indie wrestling. That's where Moxley's head is at, and they don't teach these kids the Martins any better. It's going to be too late. They're going to learn bad habits. And this went like seven or eight minutes until Moxley rolled through on a crossbody. He stomped him in the face 15 times. About 13 of them looked fake as shit. He then hit eight of those goofy elbows on the kid, then got the rear naked choke, and then switched into the double arm, whatever the fuck it is, with a suplex or power bomb or brain buster or however he decides to put people down. One, two, three. So what? My God. He wants to give the kid a good long match to make him look like something, and then he wants to beat him flatter than you ever have beaten anybody before. When you stomp somebody in the face 15 times, hit them with eight unanswered elbows, choke them for a little while, and then pick them up and dump them on their head, you about beat that motherfucker as flat as, as a motherfucker can get beat. But you gave him a great match. Does this make any sense to you, Brian? No, but Moxley likes a certain kind of match, as we know, and he likes to do certain things. Those stomps always look bad. The elbows always look bad. He does them in every match. Who's the babyface here? I don't know. The fans aren't booing Claudio. They're not booing Moxley right now. They're not booing Top Flight. They like them. I don't know what any of this... I don't know how good an idea... Then it, ju it just was. comes down to an exhibition of moves, which is meaningless. Yeah. All right, next up, the video on Powerhouse Hobbs. They've got video of him working out, lifting weights, and he's doing the voiceover. Brian, I know the phrase is, where have you been all my life, but it took him three years to do this. Just two minutes, two minutes of television time. But while he's looking big and bad with his muscles and his mean faces, the voiceover is, hey, my first memory when I was three years old was seeing my uncle overdose on the floor. Have you ever seen a man choke on his own blood? I was beaten and robbed as a child and abused. I've been stabbed and shot. Monsters did that. Monsters would do that to a, a young kid. But they 
created a monster themselves. And it's time that I spill everybody else's blood. What the f- It took him three years. Guy's been sitting there. This is fucking great. From day one. That's what he should. I re- and I remembered from this that when they made him a baby face, when they first introduced him in the first year of the show was on the air, did, did they not say that his brother was killed or shot one or the other in a drive-by shooting? Yeah, I think it was and, on commentary early on when he first started. Yeah. Gee, that you've got either a giant baby face, somebody who's pulled himself up and made something out of his life coming from a disadvantaged upbringing in the streets and crime, or you've got an origin story for a supervillain like they did here. Yeah, you do this to a kid, that makes you a monster, but you yourself, you made me a monster. There's your heel origin story. But they just figured out, well, we ought to do that. My fucking God. Anyway, on a serious wrestling show in Mid-South or Mid-Atlantic or any wrestling show before modern times, this would, two or three weeks of this, you smash this fucking guy over convincingly over several weeks of stooges, and you that's all you need. But I'm afraid that in this day and age, and I assume that everything he's saying is true because... You tend to think you wouldn't make shit like that up even in wrestling, especially when things are verifiable these days, not like the old days where everybody could win a gold medal or serve in the fucking special forces. But I'm afraid that these fans will think that it's fake because now they're convinced that everything in wrestling is fake and and they look at shit the buckaroos do and all the comedy they do on the program and this won't have as much impact but this is the way to to use Hobbs is it not yeah I mean it's after the fact they should have done this a while ago we got a big he was a baby face when they first told us the story and then he became a heel and we said why they tell us that story and then turn him and now he's been a heel for a few years and now if you're gonna make him a killer if you're gonna make him what he could be what he should be this is doing it right well, this was all part of the plan. They realized, shit, we shouldn't have said that sympathetic thing about him because we switched him heel, so we'll wait two years until everybody forgets he's even around. You hear that, Miro? So just <sighs> sit by the phone and wait. Yeah. I'm here alone, waiting by the phone, listening for one thing, ring-a-ling, so make a vow to call me now and tell me how I can help you. All right, I knew you were going to sing at some point, but... All righty. That, that was surprise. the jingle to the uh, home finance company commercials they used to play on the wrestling show back in the mid-70s. The next up contest, this long percolating feud between the ass boys, Austin and Colton Gunn, and our friends FTR, Cash and Dax. I don't if Poor Cash may be about cashed out at this point. You know, this was... Again, a, not only a good match to have, but a great finish to do. If FTR ever beat anybody and ever won anything, but they don't. So it's just another job. The FTR comes out, they get a big pop on the entrance. They showed B-roll from the double dog collar match and Sockface and Taz both actually mentioned the Briscoes by name as the Briscoes. So maybe it's a step in the right direction. But even though the story was that FTR were all taped up, they weren't 100% after the dog collar match, this is another example of Tony's... <laughs> convoluted booking or inexperienced booking or whatever, having a further reaching impact than just on one tag team or one talent. The guns are, have tons of potential. The guns I've said, they have all kinds of, they're animated and they have ability and they have talent and they kind of know where they are in the ring. They're just green. They need to work with people more experienced than they are and multiple times. And FTR would be the perfect team, an experienced team that knows how to lead a match, 
be the perfect team for guys like that to work with. But the problem is, yes, they're going to learn something regardless what the finish is by working with FTR. But it would also help their standing in the community. It would help their aura. It would help their image. It would help their over factor. If when they beat FTR, they weren't just beating a team that everybody else fucking beats and never wins and is never showcased and never featured except in other promotions and on other people's pay-per-views, it would get the guns over more if FTR was established as not just the favorite team of the fans because they know they're the best, but as a legitimate, strong force that is world title level and almost never loses. And then when it happens, it would resonate and it would help elevate the guns. But when you have, regardless of whether they're the best in-ring tag team in the world or you got the best anybody at anything in the world, if they never succeed at it, they just obviously are better at doing it and have more talent, but they never win or they never fucking prosper because of it. And it kind of gets obvious what you're doing. So they, they, and here's another thing we just saw again, the Cucamonga contingent masturbating themselves for 20 minutes in a match that we're going to, we've seen four times before, and we're going to apparently see another two, but this match on camera, what was actually telecast on the program couldn't have been seven minutes. They started out, they went to the break in the first segment after two minutes of action. When they came back, they were already getting heat on Cash, and within less than a minute, Cash had hit the cold tag to Dax because it was cold because there was no heel remotely trying or able to stop it. It was a foregone conclusion, therefore that's a cold tag. And, and then they go a couple more minutes and and go into the finish. I mean, there was some good wrestling in it. I saw an atomic drop by Cash Wheeler. God damn it, it looked good. First time in 10 years. And then, you know, in the second segment, especially when they're going into the home stretch, Dax got a nice comeback. You know, they went back and forth. Cash actually hit a dive that the gun boy didn't see coming and wiped him out with it. It wasn't, you know, the typical hee hee. But, you know, they go back and forth, and finally Dax is with Austin, and Dax gets a roll up, and Austin reverses it and rolls through, and Colton reaches in from outside to hold his hand for the leverage. One, two, three. Just that. Fine finish. Not for a team that never wins. Then you've just beat them again, and it it doesn't really help the guns because everybody else is doing it too. And again, Moxley got 10 minutes with Dante, whatever the fuck his name was. And seven minutes of this made television over two segments. So I, tell me what I'm missing here. Well, I thought the gun boys look really good. They take good bumps and you can't keep your eyes off them. They're constantly in motion. We've been big fans of FTR for a long time. We've enjoyed the stuff that they've done, but I got to admit it, at this point, AEW has kind of gotten what they wanted. They've beaten me down. Like I kind of, you know, when they come out, I know they're not going to win. They're going to get a big pop for their music. The match will be fundamentally good. But at this point, my favorite guys there have been treated like job guys for a long time, and it's hard to get into them anymore. And a lot of uh, more casual fans than we are, instead of bemoaning that, they just, they, they're not that really offended by it because they're not in the profession. So they just go, ah, yeah, those guys, well, I'll like somebody else. And, and that's the way that you basically, you know, rub off the appeal of any talent. If you, if they're obviously good, people obviously like them and they never succeed, then sooner or later, people will stop giving a shit. If you're new Japan and AAA, do you like the fact that your tag team champions are now losing all the time? Cause it was the Briscoes match. It was this match and it was the acclaimed match. Well, and, and again, somebody's going to say, well, they couldn't beat the Briscoes three times in a row. Well, you're right, they couldn't. 
But if this was a normal wrestling promotion with a normal booker and a normal philosophy about getting people over, then we would have been past the point a year and a half ago with FTR where we kept saying they need wins on TV. They need a concerted push. They need a coherent fucking path to the top. It would have been done. It's late now anyway. It's too late, probably. But <laughs> there's never been a situation I can think of where anybody of this level has come in and at the same time as they've held all these belts, <laughs> they they almost never actually win anything to show you why they got them. And most of them they won on other people's fucking programs to begin with. I, I, let's get to the good part, shall we? We are an hour and a half into this wrestling program. And here, Tony Schiavone is in the ring with Rick Ross. And when I first heard the, the announcement of this, I was like, who the fuck is that now? But I remember he's been on the program before in a pre-tape with him. He must be friends with Swerve. Apparently, he's a rapper. Tony Schiavone just go oh, glorified him. A million-selling recording artist and this guy and that guy. He's a big star. Well, I don't give a shit. But the point is, he's there to mediate, quote unquote, that was the quote, mediate the, the face-off between Keith Lee and Swerve because they've broken up their team. Swerve has switched heel. Keith is apparently just confused. I don't know what the fucking deal with his. But Rick Ross may be a celebrity to some people. But Jesus Christ on a cracker. Don't give him a live microphone anymore. Yes. For a variety of reasons. No, give him a live microphone every week. <laughs> this was the greatest segment. This is up on that list. Jade Cargill's debut. Maki Ito singing while Sheeta gets beat up by Vicky Guerrero. This is up on that list of greatest moments in AEW history. This whole segment. And and everybody had a hand in this. I mean, it, it, production, talent, matchmaking, the the bookers, the writers, the producers. I don't... You see, the genius of the Jade debut was Cody's doing a promo. This woman you've never seen before shows up, seems to be doing a promo in her own world. <laughs> You're trying to figure out what's going on. Then the Brandy thing happened, so that's the second thing. And then after all that, if you remember... I think it was Cajun Starks attack Cody and Darby had to come through the crowd to save him. <laughs> Just like with this one. There's all this stuff happening with Rick Ross and Keith Lee and then even more bad shit happens that makes it even greater. Well, and, and that's... It. I gotta be honest with you. Obviously, I've seen and been around and been a part of segments that had different moving parts and something would go off kilter or you'd have to cover for something, but I've never seen anything like this where it was like everybody involved in this segment they just sent them out there and said make some make some shit up on the fly and they all had different ideas and did them at the same time tony was in the ring with rick ross introduces rick ross and then tony didn't know who was coming out first and and he actually said i think we're bringing out keith with a question mark, and there was an awkward pause, and then the music plays, and here comes Keith Lee. And I'm thinking, well, now Tony will probably be able to get the next one right. You know, we've narrowed it down. But Rick Ross grabs a microphone from Tony. And this guy is supposed to be the mediator. But we've already established, I think, in the interview a few weeks ago, he was friends with Swerve, but now he makes the big introduce introduction. Introduction. <laughs> For Swerve, he introduced, let's bring out the young legend, Swerve. Hey, if you're Keith Lee in kayfabe at that point, don't you think something's up? One would think, hey, isn't he being a little more friendly to this guy than he is to me, our mediator, right? You would have to, but nevertheless, Swerve, like Merv. He sounded like Arthur Treacher. No music plays. There's a pause. Rick Ross says, hey, we, we, he asked for the music. He said, play the music. Do this thing upright. And then nothing's happening. And here, the swerve ain't coming out. 
And that's when Ross turns around and looks at Keith Lee and just says right into the microphone on TBS, you know, you're a big motherfucker. <laughs> and I, what the... And, <laughs> and it went out live. So if you're watching live on yes. that was like, did he just say that? <laughs> and there, it was, it was done before they could even hit. Cause if they're, I'm assuming they're still on a seven second delay or some kind of situation because they've been bleeping in the past when, but they, they don't always catch it, but there was no effort to catch it. Cause it came out of nowhere. Cause you know, there's something going on in the production truck. They can't get the music to work. Something's happening. Everybody's standing around. And I bet the fucking, the guy on the with his finger on the button was like, "Well, nothing's happening." And suddenly, here's motherfucker. Oh shit! Too late. So, and even Keith Lee goes over to the ropes and makes a cut his mic signal at his throat and makes a funny face to one of the floor producers off camera. And then Rick Ross is still talking. He's, "We coming to make history. We coming to make." He keeps saying, "We're coming to make history," and then he just starts ad libbing just saying shit. And at that point, there's never any music plays. Swerve just comes out talking on a microphone. And he's he's in a long black coat and he's dragging something that you couldn't see. It was like a bag or a sack or a box or something. You couldn't really see it on the camera shot. But he's talking. And he's saying that he can't, it sounds like a Bray Wyatt interview where he's saying shit, but he ain't getting to a point, but he said, I can't be putting up with all these accusations. And then Rick Ross starts doing Swerve's promo in the ring to Keith Lee's face over the top of Swerve. They're both talking at the same time. That's right. He can't be putting up with those accusations. And now Keith Lee is still standing there like, well, are you for me or against me? And he don't know what the fuck's going on. So then Swerve tells Keith Lee, you need to keep an eye out. You need to keep track of what's going on. As a matter of fact, you need to keep eyes in the back of your head. And then nothing happens. And then Rick Ross says, it's the young legend. <laughs> <laughs> we going to make history. And nothing's <laughs> happening. And then suddenly... Parker Boudreaux, who must have got stuck in that left turn at Albuquerque was so low. Let's stop. You know who he is. No one out there knows who he is. The people who watch the show every week have no idea who he is. Okay, well, listen to me for a second. He hits the ring, but he doesn't hit the ring and attack Keith Lee. He hits the ring and stands behind Keith Lee. And Parker Boudreaux, I'm now was going to explain, is the guy that they had signed in a WWE developmental and he was there for a while and they had big plans that originally, and then suddenly he was released and he signed here and we saw him once and we haven't seen him again. It's been months. So yes, you're right. Almost nobody in the building knew who the fuck it was. The announcer said Parker Boudreaux. So Parker comes from behind Keith Lee and spins him around and starts attacking him with some of the most awkward-looking shit that I have ever seen. It's like he was a bucket of disconnected arms and legs, just wailing away. And maybe this is why he got dropped at the Performance Center. Keith Lee never went down. He just went to the corner <laughs> and kind of cut... It's, it, this is becoming a running theme. Keith Lee doesn't really go down or sell. He just kind of leans over in the corner or on the floor and bundles up and they just kick him. So Parker, boom, 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 hits him with all this shit. Keith Lee just bends over and sells in the corner, then goes to shoot him off and Keith Lee reverses it and shoots Boudreaux off and clotheslines him over the top. And Parker got that bump, so he did that one. So then Keith Lee turns back to Swerve, who's still in the aisle, and Rick Ross has still got the microphone, and he's over in the corner going, whoa, whoa. Every time somebody takes a bump now, he's going to go, whoa. And Lee goes to start to go after Swerve and some big tattooed fucker with a mohawk and a tattooed face jumps Keith Lee in the aisle, and Keith Lee sits down on the floor <laughs> while the guy kicks him 10 times and they look like shit because you can tell as green as Parker Boudreaux is, this guy is greener than chlorophyll. 
I mean, awkward broad arms. He didn't really know what to do with Keith Lee once he got him down there. And Lee's getting back up and fighting him back. And then Boudreaux comes from behind with a chair to Keith Lee's back. Quam! And Keith Lee, he sold it like a reverse junkyard dog stiffen up and fall bump, where he stiffened up and went to his knees and just rolled over on the floor. There must be a health issue going on where he can't take bumps or he can't, I don't know what the fuck. Anyway, they both got on him and didn't really know what to do because he's so big and he's so immobile and they're so green. So it looked more or less like they started humping him. Did you see that when they were, they had their bodies and they were kind of pelvis thrusting him into the goddamn back of the apron of the ring or whatever. I'm like, they're humping him. And while they're doing this, Rick Ross is screaming, it's time to make history. And they pull out the ring steps. And by the way, nobody is trying to break any of this up. Nobody's trying to stop it. There ain't no bell ring and there's no referees. They're just, there's a goddamn multi-platinum Grammy award-winning artist screaming, it's time to make history. While two jolly green giants are beating the shit out of a giant black hole of charisma. So then they put Keith Lee on top of the ring steps. And now they pull whatever he'd had in the bag or the sack or whatever. It's a fake cinder block. And it looked pretty good as they pulled it out, but you'll find out it's fake in a second. Because they pull out the cinder block and they set it on Keith Lee's chest as Keith Lee is laying back first on the steel ring steps. And then... While Swerve is climbing to the top rope, Rick Ross, and I listened to this five times, and this is as close as I can come to the transcription, Rick Ross is screaming, I need you to know it is official. Mogul Affiliates has farted it up. I don't know what he said. The name of their group is Mogul Affiliates, and it's official. Apparently, they farted it up. I don't know what... Did you hear what he... Could you tell what he was saying? I don't know what he was saying. Yeah. Mogul Affiliates, so, though. I don't know about that name. Mogul Affiliates. And so then Swerve comes off the top rope with a double foot stomp onto the fake cinder block sitting on Keith Lee while he's laying on the ring steps, and the cinder block broke in a thousand pieces. Brian? I don't care if you weigh 500 pounds. If you set a cinder block on a human body and jump with both feet on that, is the cinder block going to bust in a million pieces or is the human body going to burst like a sack of fucking buzzard innards from a butcher shop? Which is going to happen? I've never seen a cinder block, Blake. Blake. I've never seen a cinder block. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen a cinder block break like that. And Rick Ross said, it is official. This was the biggest fiasco that I've ever seen in my life. Rick Ross doesn't know what he's doing in there. I, I, I guess probably they gave him the gist of what he was supposed to say, but he don't remember it. He's, he doesn't do wrestling promos. The, the two guys that they had attacked Keith Lee don't do wrestling angles. Never have before, most probably. The goddamn... The, it, it, you couldn't double foot stomp a guy off the top rope while he's laying on a fucking uh, set of ring steps 10 feet below. You've got to add a cinder block? Um... It, the whose music are we playing? The music don't work. Who's coming out? It was just incredible. And the motherfucker, you a big motherfucker. The plan nine of outer space of wrestling angles. They just uh, production layout, talent, delivery work, bad props, complete confusion. This is up there in the pantheon of the immortals. When Boudreaux got in there and started hitting Keith Lee, it was almost like when you're a kid and you play wrestler and you do a move and then you do like some, I don't know what you call it. You put your arms out like, ah, 
Yeah. Yeah. He did that after every single time he hit him. It looks so fake. And then the other thing is, and we don't know who the tattooed man will end up being. Apparently, he's a former minor league baseball player that is uh, now part of AEW. But they've done this a few times. I don't think it ever works, the idea of debuting people you've never seen before in this fashion. Where all of a sudden, they're just beating someone up, or all of a sudden, they're just there, and you have no idea who the hell they are. The only way that you can make a debut of an unknown is when they are not only, they have to, some combination of two things. Number one, they're incredibly visually impressive. And number two, they can do enough in the ring that you can give them three or four things to big moves to do and make an impact. And, and I know somebody's going to say, well, what this big, Six foot something tattooed face painted mohawk fucking guy isn't visually impressive. Not these days, no. Because everybody looks like that. I'm talking about Jonah. Uh, uh, what's it? What's his old name? Bronson Reed. Bronson Reed. Okay. He could be an unknown that can make an impression because you can bring that big fucking guy out and let him do that splash off the top rope. And everybody go, holy fuck. It's like when you used to bring out the giant or Abdullah the Butcher or the goddamn freak or the behemoth or whatever. Somebody that's either tall enough or heavy enough or jacked enough or whatever that they stand out from whatever the current standards are and they can do even one or two things incredibly impressively and you build the segment around that, that's a surprise debut. The first time people... In the 70s, saw Crusher Blackwell. He comes out looking like a fat fucking bearded country fuck. What is that? And then the, at the bell, he hits a guy on the chin with a drop kick at 450 pounds. Be, oh, shit. That's the kind of impression you need to make. And even if they look visually impressive, if they can't work, then that's, you know, half or more of the fucking thing to where they've got to be able to do a couple of things to get over bam bam bigelow he could get over cold because as soon as he came out and did that cartwheel at that size and then it did a drop kick or whatever the fuck he did then you're like holy shit it's a jacob fatu he could get over cold because all he'd have to do is come out and have that animosity and fucking hit that big power slam or one of those big power moves and then the springboard moonsault he oh shit there was no O shit here. There was just plenty of shit, but no O. So anyway, and then we were well, ready we're, for the... Go and ahead. One, one last thing, because we've seen a lot of various, mostly hip-hop people, but even Shaq, we've seen different celebrities show up and disappear quickly. Snoop Dogg, Trina, Mike Tyson. I forgot about Trina. Various people. Based on the way this angle happened and the way Rick Ross was on the mic the entire time, is he coming back? Is he going to be a part of this every week? Because he kind of, they kind of set it up so he has to be, didn't they? Well, if it made any sense, he would, the way this came off, he is the manager or the manipulator of the group putting these people together, mogul affiliates. But I would imagine if he's as big a star as everybody claims he is, since I couldn't pick him out of a police lineup, I'm sure he's probably been in a few, and I've never heard any of his music, I would, but I would have to think he's busy. So, you know, are they, they going to have him pre-tape instructions and send them in to the TVs he came? I don't know. And then, goddamn, if he does come back, I mean, is he going to get him kicked off television, or is is you know, is he going to forget what he's supposed to say, or you know, it could be wonderful. It could be just wonderful. But I have no, one would think he would be involved with this group, but then one would think a number of things logically from things they do on this TV and it doesn't work out that way. I don't know. Uh, so the, the big gamble, Brian, I think this was a response to your observation here a, a week or two ago that every time they put the women's segment on the viewership tanks. So this time they figured, well, we'll wait until the last match and put the girls segment there. And if they tune out, 
that's where everybody tunes out anyway when they see the main event come up. But they left 20 minutes on the air for Jamie Hayter against Takaru Shida for the AEW women's title. And, of course, Britt Baker and Reba were in the corner. I'm, it, it, it sounded like, from what I watched at the end, that they had the people, and it had been a good match. To be quite honest with you, by the time we got to this point, I said, I don't care if this is Rhea Ripley against Charlotte Flair and they're naked. I've had enough of this fucking program, and I cannot watch any more of this shit. So I went to the finish. And again, sounded like they had a good match. I'm not going to knock it. But I will knock the finish because these have got to be Tonys. They got to be because you would think if you've been in the wrestling business for 15 minutes, you could do better than this. So obviously, as we said, Britt and Reba are at ringside. Hikaru Shida's kicking the shit out of Jamie Hayter. And finally, they're going to do a spot where... Reba draws the referee and Britt gets up on the apron of the ring with the kendo stick. But suddenly they saw their cue. So Britt got up on the apron with the kendo stick and Paul Turner, the referee, and he's been on the ball because he's been around for a while. He sees her getting up across the ring and immediately snaps his head around to Reba, drawing her up because she was late. So now Reba's got the referee. Baker's got the kendo stick on the apron. Hikaru Shida pulls Baker into the ring over the top rope, and instead of fighting over the stick, Hikaru Shida is punching Britt Baker in the head barehanded while Britt Baker's just standing there holding a weapon, getting punched in the head. And then Shida leaves Britt Baker alone, lets go of her. She's standing there on her feet with a kendo stick, staggering, and Shida goes to the middle of the ring and then runs back to the turnbuckle and jumps up and kicks off of the turnbuckle and drop kicks Britt Baker while she was standing there waiting for Sheeta to do it, and then Britt Baker drops the kendo stick. And here's the thing. Yes, it was a wonderfully snazzy move when she ran to the corner and jumped up on and blah, blah, blah. But meanwhile, on the other side of the ring... The referee's back is turned, being drawn by the other manager at ringside, and the clock is ticking. So that's where an a experienced booker would say, can your goddamn fancy fucking run up the ropes, fight over that stick and get it done, because the referee's distracted. But they have no restraint. So... Sheeta then gets the stick and wall wallops Britt Baker with it, and Britt Baker goes to the floor, and Sheeta drops the stick in the ring. And it's not going to be figured in again, but she doesn't know enough about the rules of wrestling to realize that she should throw the stick out of the goddamn ring because when the referee turns around, he's going to see a stick laying in the ring. So Reba gets down, and referee Paul Turner turns around. I put the stopwatch on it. He was distracted for 35 seconds while all that shit went on. So already, whoever came up with and laid out this finish has shit the bed. Hater rolls through on a Hurricane Rana and into a power bomb, gets a two count. The people were going crazy. They should have put this on earlier before I got fed up with the fucking program. Hater hits a clothesline, gets a two count, and then hits the ripcord. That's her finish. And gets the three count. So, <laughs> after all again, after all of this interference and Zabada and bullshit and caca to get the people up and into all these twists and turns, after all the interference is done with, Instead of the baby face, then, or in this case, the heel, actually, since the heel's going over, and instead of the baby face, then going for a Hail Mary, which is what she did with the Hurricane Rana, but Hater rolled through it and came up with a power bomb. Boom, right there. One, two, three, they're up. The baby face almost has it. The heel rolls through and gets a quick boom. 
one, two, three. Instead, that's a two count. Then a clothesline is a two count. Then she hits the baby face with her finish and beats her flat in the middle. So they've gone from all this up and down and getting the people on this ride with the interference and the kendo stick and the referee turning his back and blah, blah, blah. And then get the baby face in a spot where she looks like she's going to do it, but the heel rolls through, bam, one, two, three. Instead, the heel rolls through one, two on the power bomb, and then another kick out and then beats her flat with the finish. So the baby face was beaten flat. All the interference in the gaga was for nothing. It was nullified. And they got a flat fucking finish there. And the people were loving the match, and people loved this finish. But it would have made more sense and accomplished a bit better of the point if they didn't have to, again, the heel could have snatched it away by the skin of her teeth on the power bomb, or beat the baby face flat with three finishes in a row. So that's what they did. And then the heels jumped on Sheeta to get some more heat. And here came Tony Storm. She made a save, and then they beat her up too. And then my DVR froze, because they're always drastically out of time. And that was the name of that tune. Do you see what I'm talking about with the finish, or am I just being too picky? I see what you're talking about with the finish. You did miss a good match. It was a really good match. I, I, I will even concur with that and say that if I could have stomached any more of these people, I would have probably liked to watch it, but I just, I needed to get the fuck out of there. Oh, so I understand they had uh, some turmoil over some of the ratings this past week. They got a little asterisk. They played a little trick, got a little overrun to sap some 10 p.m. Eastern uh, uh, numbers off the last or uh, onto the last uh, quarter hour. Or what's going on? Well, let's talk about the ratings real quick. The overall number was 957,000 viewers, which is up 7,000 from last week overall. Brandon Thurston of WrestleNomics has posted the quarter hour breakdowns. The first quarter, which is Ricky Stark's live promo, his angle with the Jericho Appreciation Society and Action Andretti. 1,133,000 viewers. So the, the Big Bang episode that night was a, a, a favorite, right? Why don't they get the guys from the Big Bang Theory to be in the first segment? Boy, they ought to. You, could, you couldn't tell the difference. Actually, they don't even need the Big Bang Theory stars because you can't tell the difference between those nerds and the fucking nerds in the wrestling fucking locker room. Just have them comb their hair the same way and send them out there. Segment two... The Elite versus Death Triangle Match 5, 1,008,000 viewers. Oh, gee, so they, 20, let's hold on, I'm doing them at 25,000, no, 125,000 people, a, a 15 minutes into the show said fuck it. Well, 15 minutes later, segment 3, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m., the finish of the previous match, MJF's taped backstage promo, Action Andretti being burned by the Jericho Appreciation Society. Brian Danielson interviewed by Renee Paquette and confronted by Ethan Page and Stokely Hathaway. 975,000 viewers. So between the start of the program and the time that the EVPs finished their business and the rest of that stuff went on, they had lost 158,000 viewers. All right. The fourth quarter. 8.45 to 9 p.m., which has the final two minutes of the Danielson confrontation with Ethan Page and Stokely, Moxley's backstage promo, Samoa Joe's promo, Exodus Prime versus Hook, The Firm attacking Jack Perry backstage, and Moxley's entrance, 950,000 viewers. They ran another 25,000 off. The 9 o'clock hour, John Moxley versus Darius Martin as well as a Sheeta and Hater video and a Powerhouse Hobbs video, 952,000 viewers. They, got, they picked up 2,000 people at the top of the hour with John Moxley headed to the ring. 915 to 930, FTR vs. The Guns, as well as Jeff Jarrett, Jay Lethal, and Sanjay's music video, 
And Rick Ross and Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland's live promo. Oh boy. 895,000 viewers. There, oh my, there went another 557,000. And by the way, I didn't mention, but yes, there was a music video where Sanjay and Jeff and Zippy and Jay Lethal rapped about the acclaimed. And it, uh, yeah. Boy, they've really gotten their money's worth out of that giant, haven't they? <sighs> Guy just shows up and stands there, does nothing. Why even use him if that's the case? That wastes a giant. Why have a giant if he's going to come out there and do nothing forever? But I'll tell you what, he's going to have a hell of a finish. He's going to use the spear as a finish. Only the thing is, with that pointed head, he's going to run straight into the guy and fucking impale them. And then they're, he's going to stand up and they're going to be fucking just dangling off his fucking protruding giant pinhead. That won't be on TBS, ladies and gentlemen, but what was on TBS... What will be is you a big motherfucker. 9.30 to 9.45, which was the final five minutes of the you're a big motherfucker promo, <laughs> as well as the Dark Order, uh, just says Dark Order, comma, I don't remember what the Dark Order did. Oh, right here. Dark Order Best Friends video and the first five minutes of Hater vs. Sheeta, 873,000 viewers. There went another 22,000. So now at the start of the main event of the program, 127, 227, they have lost 260,000. Is that right? Yeah, 260,000 people. Well, the final segment, the final quarter, 9.45 to 10 p.m., but we'll have something to say after this. Once again, Hater versus Sheeta, 869,000 viewers. And what I wanted to say before you do your final analysis here, what Brandon Thurston put here is the one minute overrun, 10 to 10.01 p.m., which is the post match with Britt Baker and Rebel involved and Tony Storm and Soraya, 948,000 for the one minute overrun. <laughs> so people so were including that in the rating and saying that the women's match did better than previous main events. Oh, good God. One minute. There was no way to even, they're expecting anybody to believe that, what was that, 900 and how many thousand? The, oh, the overall overrun? number, was, oh, the overrun was 948,000. Okay, they're, they're expecting anybody to believe that 79,000 people suddenly said, oh shit, Sheeta and Hater are one minute from the finish, we gotta flip over. They were looking for the next fucking program. At the 10 o'clock hour, and they turn and they see an extra minute of the wrestling show. But <laughs> they started with 1,133,000, ended up with 869,000. That's 261,000 people that they ran off in two hours. And, and there were 80,000 people just waiting to watch the next thing. Yeah. And. Uh, <laughs> And here, again, I, I've said, going back to the Attitude Era, the audience is built. The main event was the, the Clash of Champions for WCW in the 80s, the 90s, Raw, whatever. The main event was the big number. This is a complete reversal of trend. Now, Raw, the other week, uh, did the same thing, and, and the worst hour was the third hour, but one can kind of you know, agree with that or understand that because after three fucking hours of that shit, holy Christ, how much more can you watch? But none of this is good. And when you don't outperform your lead in, when you're, when you're in prime time, which in, in the United States of America and the television industry is viewed as from 8 to 11 p.m., that's prime time. When you're not outperforming a rerun of a syndicated program that's in primetime adjacency, 7 to 8 or 7.30 to 8, and you're not outperforming that, that's not a good sign to the TV network. And I don't, what, what's on before Raw these days? I don't know, because I'm usually not watching Raw at a Well, that's club. true. You know what we need to do? We need to, before the next program... We need to figure out what Raw's lead-in is and what its numbers are and what its numbers are in comparison to Raw both when it starts and when it finishes. Are they picking up a bunch of viewers that have been watching you know, the Galloping Gourmet or whatever and losing those fairly quickly afterwards? Or does it take Raw 
an hour and a half or two hours or whatever to start really losing any appreciable audience just because it's so fucking long. That's an interesting comparison we ought to make. We probably will do that. <laughs>